podcast from Adele Technology today. Today, we're very fortunate to be joined by Matthew Mace from Aquaria, the Chief Scientific Officer. Hello, Matthew. Hey, pleasure. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. Um, I'm very impressed with the technology and your background. Matthew, would you mind describing your professional background to the audience, please? Yeah, exactly. So um, I started off uh, 13 years ago in cardiology. I trained as a technician here in the in the UK, uh, specializing in heart failure. Um, very shortly after that, I actually joined um, industry to try to create a bigger impact on the world. So I've worked at companies like St. Jude Medical on some of their heart failure products, which then later became Abbott. Uh, did that for seven years um, almost, and then um, progressed into the AI and ML world where you know what I'm trying to do is try to bring innovative technologies to the world of cardiology of, of uh, leveraging AI as much as possible. So that's a bit about my background and I guess I've been here a while. Okay, so you're the Chief Scientific Officer of Aquaria. Now, could you tell me something about the company? Yeah, exactly. What, you know, what we're doing is um, trying to invent a device and validate a, a non-invasive way of checking intracardiac pressure. Now, that's a, a very fancy way of saying that we're looking at the, the pressure inside uh, patients who have heart failure uh, inside the heart between the, the heart and lungs. And we know that's the most important vital sign to track in these patients. But the only way to do that today is by invasive methods. So we, we hope to be the first to bring it to a non-invasive platform. So you, you, when you're talking about doing it non-invasively, are you talking about doing it inside a cath lab? Yeah. So we have to validate our device in the cath lab. And I think scientifically, that's the right place to start. Uh, and ultimately, we're restricted today about being in a cath lab. And what we want to do is bring these insights that you can get about the patients and about their condition out into, first of all, the ward, and then into the outpatient clinics, and then eventually in the future, directly to outpatients, directly for the patients to see themselves. Okay, that's interesting. Now tell me, how does it work non-invasively? <laughs> I mean, that's the, the million dollar question, I guess. Um, you know, we have a great team around us who, who focus solely on the hardware. When they started the company in 2019, realizing that the hardware just doesn't exist uh, out there to, to gain these insights. A lot of people are trying with ECGs, uh, with watch technologies, but, you know, th that hardware doesn't exist. So what we've built is a, a device, a, a standalone handheld device, which uses four sensor technologies, which we call the, the save sensor system. So it uses uh, seismic, acoustic, visual, and ECG sensors in combination with AI and machine learning to be able to predict uh, what the pressure is. It's a very clever way of saying we know how much the blood vessels are moving. We know how fast the uh, blood is moving through the, the vessels, and we know approximately how much oxygenation is in there. Um, so we know the speed. So we have an understanding of pressure from basic scientific principles and I guess the fancy bells and whistles are using AI and, and machine learning to, to achieve that. And I understand you've got your first study coming up at Harefield. Yeah, exactly. And we're super excited. So um, this is the a global study. So of uh, up to 16 sites with 1,200 patients. And this is a side-by-side -side comparison of, of our technology and the right heart catheterization, the, the invasive gold standard to, to improve our model, to train our device to be more effective and then ultimately validate that so we can go to the regulators and and put ourselves in the market by uh, the end of next year if not 2025. Can you tell me how you facilitated that? That's a big project. I mean that's a lot of centers around the world. Yeah exactly it's not it's not an easy job and again credit to the big team that we have so we have a, a head of clinical in, in in the Netherlands as well as a, a big group of, of teams as well as a, a CRO in, in Sweden um, it's a big effort, and to, to be honest, I think some of the jurisdictions don't make it as easy as it could be for startups to get into hospital. Um, so we've been very fortunate to par partner with the Royal Brompton and and Hereford Hospitals, um, you know, being championed by o OSR and and Mark Mason, the leadership, um, to really push ourselves through the studies and, and get involved in there. So um, it's a lot of coordination. It's taken almost a year to get all of those pieces in together. So we're about to start the study, which is very exciting. It feels like all the bloodshed, sweat, sweat and tears have uh, actually paid off. 
Mark Mason is without doubt one of the most insightful medical directors in the National Health Service, I think. Tell me, with this particular technology, can it be used at home? Can it be used elsewhere? And it can be used in other community settings? Yeah, exactly. That's the the end objective, whether it's the NHS or you're talking about the, the US healthcare system, you know, we ultimately treat patients in a very expensive way and they're called hospitals. Um, so the drive is to get everyone out of hospital. What we have to do in the challenges of technology companies, you have to go back to the scientific principles behind you. So there's a long road ahead of us to get out of hospital, but equally we're on that first exciting step by proving that it works within hospital and then we can help support the NHS in its, in its ability to treat more patients effectively by moving out of hospital into outpatients and then eventually home care settings. So we're detecting early heart failure is really what we're doing? Yeah, exactly. So a, a bit of background. So people, there is a, you know about 6 million people here in the UK who have heart failure and they erroneously turn up into hospital with uh, what we call decompensated heart failure, which for a lot of patients and for even physicians, it took them a little bit by surprise. What we know is that if we have routine follow-ups of these patients, we could detect what we call congestion early. Um, and the best way of detecting congestion is with you know numbers and facts and figures, right? So we hope to be able to offer those supporting uh, uh, diagnostic tools to help find patients to stop them erroneously coming into hospital to be treated well at home and they have a better quality of life. So early detection obviously means better outcome. Always. I think always in the natural history of, of science, early detection and prevention always leads to overall lower healthcare burden for entire society. So that's where the NHS have put their flag in their five-year plan. And we want to obviously continue with that. So, so it's detecting congestive heart failure type two. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the interesting thing we've learned over the last 10 years, so the product called CardioMEMS, which I, I was involved with at Abbott, um, was able to show that patients who have symptoms, so we call them class two and class three patients, have congestion that makes sense. But what we've realized is that patients who don't have symptoms also have congestion. And if we're able to identify those, we can stop them developing symptoms and stop them to coming into hospital. So the, the reach is a lot more broader than we originally anticipated. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago when CardioMEMS came on the market, we think we were focusing on very sick patients only. And I think there's been a renaissance in understanding hemodynamics, which uh, Akarai can be a part of. Interesting, because I think there's been a lot of work in the past on central aortic um, pressure and central aortic flow, and it's been a, an algorithm, much like yourself, but an inter it's been a secondary algorithm of a black box of mathematics. So I think that there's a definitely an unmet need. Um, yeah. I know with, I've seen with pressure waves, um, both from um, the, early, the early days in Australia and Sydney, at the University of New South Wales, at Medical School, Medical School and also out of Hungary, they were doing peripheral Dopplers in order to assess the transfer function for central pressures. Yours is obviously a step closer to the truth. Yeah, exactly. I think what's really accessible to us ordinarily is the peripherals, the arterial pressure. And so I think a lot of research in the last, say, 30 years has been very much focused on the arterial pressure. It's not a very good marker of congestive heart failure. It's it's quite good. It does help patients. And it does help keep patients out of hospital, but it's not a it's not a panacea. Um, direct pressure is the gold standard, so we want to get closer and closer towards that. And I think one of the the key the key points that we we try to think about is all of these prior technologies have been a development step in our understanding, and there are different types of devices that suit different patients needs and i think when we look at direct pressure we know that this definitely helps patients who have have more critical heart failure uh, and to prevent them coming in and i think all of these learnings that we've seen have definitely they've helped us and we we reference some of these these materials as we go and, and we develop our products the study will you be titrated against um swan gans or invasive pressure yeah 
so it's a the simple the actual study is relatively simple so the patient goes into the cath lab they they lie down on the on the table and they have our device placed on their chest uh, we also have a, a watch component to collect extra extra data we record for five minutes um, we just collect all of these hemodynamic and sensor data from the device and then we stop that portion of the study what we then move on to is a uh, a right heart cath, which is a standard swan gantz, um, most of them implanted in the in the neck. We collect all the pressures on the way through, and we collect cardiac output. Uh, very standard procedure. Approximately, you know, eight to ten percent of heart failure patients in the world will actually re receive one of these in their in their yeah. lifetime. Um, nice and simple, straightforward, uh, routinely done at the Harefield. Um, but the UK is a good example where the Harefield do quite a lot of right heart catheterizations and then you're going another 40 60 miles before you get to yeah. another site who who could do them so it's about equity of distribution of these hemodynamics more more than the actual test itself well i think that the, the, the technology is very exciting for, for that reason and many others tell me will you be measuring wedge pressure exactly so um the one thing we've realized over the last you know, decade is that wedge pressure is the number one vital sign that we should be checking. Um, we can achieve that two ways. We can achieve that by doing a swan gans catheter. Uh, devices like CardioMens have proven it's uh, able to do that in a remote setting or at least estimate it. Um, so we'll be doing that yeah. as our, our number one outcome uh, of what we want to do in the study, as well as other things like cardiac output and and the, the central pressure as we've previously spoken about. Absolutely. So I think that the indications for use really accelerate when you look at the fact that you can, if you can get an accurate wedge pressure, it can be used in so many other settings in, in, in operating theatres and inside of intensive care units and, yeah. and, and emergency units. Yeah, the sky's the limit in terms of the applica application of the technology. I think what makes uh, investors and it makes hospitals very excited to work with us. Um, We've essentially gone for a core technology, which we're able to produce hemodynamics from. We are just selecting and focusing on heart failure today, selecting and focusing on the wedge pressure. But, you know, interventionist physicians, uh, valve physicians, and even non-cardiologists, uh, anesthetists, et cetera, they all have an application that they want to use our device for. And now it's just incumbent upon our system to show it works in, in clinical practice. This is, I think this is, a, a, for, for me personally, it's very interesting because it could replace transesophageal Dopplers. I yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's back to the previous comment about there's the right technology for the right patient at the right time. You know, some of these tests that we do are the right test to do for a patient. So transesophageal Doppler I used to do actually clinically. It is the right test to do when you're replacing a valve. It's, it's not potentially the right test to do when you're trying to estimate pressure in the pulmonary system, yeah. um, however it is used in, in some of those cases. So it's making sure we utilize resources more effectively. So if there are low cost ways of getting the clinically meaningful information, then we should use them rather than uh, Doppler, which you know maybe takes 45 minutes to an hour to collect and requires a, an expert uh, technician to, to perform that procedure. I think that's okay. That that hadn't occurred to me. Absolutely. I think it's also a wonderful way of titrating cardiac drugs more effectively. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting is that yeah, every pharmaceutical company you speak to today talks about personalizing medication. Um, yes. But we haven't found the right formula of how to do that. Um, and ultimately, it goes back to having the right tools. So I think there's a lot of leveraging of ECG data today to personalize medication, especially for atrial fibrillation. Um, Whereas uh, making sure you personalize medicine for heart failure patients is a little bit more challenging. CardioMEMS, again, has done a great job at showing you can personalize medication, um, but we just need to give a broader access to those sort of technologies. So what's the patient population? Is it um, what age is the cutoff point for this particular study? Yeah, so we, we've been purposefully um, broad in the way that we've done. So anyone from 18 to through to however however old you want to be. So in our we did a, an initial pilot study in Sweden of uh, almost 400 patients. The age range is worse from 18, and the oldest patient we had was 88 uh, in that study. So a really broad church of heart failure. 
I think what's interesting is clinically is that, and the the most uh, disappointing thing is heart failure isn't a disease that we know when you get to a certain age threshold, you'll definitely get it. It affects patients over a really broad demographic, a really broad age range, and it can hit people at times when they least expect it. Um, that's the most disappointing thing. And I think it's the number one reason why people attend uh, the emergency department in the UK. So we need to come up with ways of identifying these patients to intervene sooner and then ultimately keep them out of hospital and, and keep them on a, a more fulfilled lifestyle. I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think the technology that I've seen thus far in um, in Sweden is a game changer. And I congratulate you on on being where you are at the time where you are and, and also securing the support of Harefield in the UK, which I think is a ga also a game changer for the National Health Service. Exactly. And the credit to the Royal Brompton and Harefield, you know, they are a, a bastion of technology. Um, they've always been pushing forward. I'd say under the leadership of Mark Mason, I think is 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 phenomenal there. You know, they have a, a long, long legis legacy of firsts in the world, first heart and lung transplant, um, but also, you know, first to describe brain neuretic peptides, which is the current standard of care for heart failure patients. So they're in this space. They are very relevant. They're not going to go away, and they always try to push the NHS into ways of, of being more effective of how you manage resources. Now, yeah. with the combination of Guy's and St. Thomas's, they can only uh, champion that goal even more, I think. I think it's a fantastic organisation, and under the, the, the leadership of Mark, it's improving all the time. Um, all right. Well, I wanted to thank you very much for your time today and uh, coming on board and describing the technology. I'd love to get back to you in six months' time. While, while you're well and truly into the study and yeah. um, making the, uh, the hallmark pilots across the planet. Um, thank you very much for your time. And I hope to talk to you very soon. Really appreciate it. I'd love to give you an update in the future. And thanks, uh, thanks again for the opportunity.